Dean's question is about using uh, an oscillator. So let's see, he's got the ultimate oscillator. And so uh, the question is about, let's see, checking whether the oscillator is, let's see, it is below some value uh, for X number of bars or X number of days. And then we want to know, uh, I guess as soon as it crosses above this value here. All right. So give me a moment here to get a chart set up. And let's see, as far as oscillators go, maybe I'll use the stochastics. Um, I'll see if I have an ultimate oscillator. And there we go, there's an ultimate oscillator. All right. And it looks, since it has a nice description, I'm assuming that this ultimate oscillator actually comes with NinjaTrader. So good, all right, we'll use that. So let's put that on the chart. And let's see here. Oh, looks like I need to change, change the plot colors here so we can read it. All right, so there's our indicator. And I guess we'll use whatever um, line values we have on here already. Uh, so let's, let's see here. So we have, all right. 30, 50, and 70. All right. So I guess we'll look for uh, below 30 um, and above 70 for so many bars. Okay. There. Let's see. All right. So we have our ultimate oscillator on the chart. I think we're ready to go. Um, so let's get Bloodhound opened. And... Let's see, first thing we want to do is put today's file name in there. Let's see, yeah, so welcome to the last day of May. All right, so there's our Bloodhound file name, template name. And well, I'm just going to start working on the logic board here. So working on the logic template, or working on the logic tab, I mean, sorry. Um, and then let's hit the new button to get a logic template started here. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, all right, well, so there's some kind of a name there for our logic template for what we're looking for here. All right, so um, yeah, detecting whether an indicator is below a value or above it, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we'll, we'll use a um, threshold solver for doing that, right? So if we're looking for um, an indicator to be below 30, um, right? 30 is considered a threshold level, right? Or above 70. 70 is a threshold level. So we'll, let's grab that. Grab the threshold solver there. All right, and let me do one more adjustment to the indicator here. There we go. Just want to make those levels a little obvious on the chart there. There we go. Okay, get Bloodhound back up. All right, so let's connect up our solver here. And let's name this we're looking for. Set the 70 and 30 levels here. All right, next step. Let's plug in our indicator here. And let's go find the ultimate oscillator. There it is. All right, so I'm just using the default settings. So nothing to change there, but just remember to change your parameters if you are using different settings. All right, this indicator only has one plot. So it's already selected for us. Nothing to do there, it's pretty simple. Just click the OK button now, so we're all done. Next, we're going to put in our threshold levels here. Um, now, we'll, we're going to set this up to give us uh, a, a digital type of an output instead of, a, instead of a, a, uh, the fuzzy logic output here. So what that means is we're going to put in the values that we're looking for. We're going to put them in twice, like so, right? And then the lower value is 30, so we need to put that in twice. And now with the threshold solver, 
your your uh, values have to be in descending order. So that means we can't have this zero left in the middle because zero to 30 is not descending order. So just pick a number in the middle, it doesn't really matter. And uh, so I'll just throw 50 in there. All right, next step is to figure out um, what um, outputs we want here. So let's see here. Um, I'm going to assume that this is a, a counter trend system um, because the last part of the question wants to know when the indicator um, crosses outside or crosses above that level or crosses below that level after so many bars. So it kind of sounds like a counter trend system here. So that means, so for a long, um, let's see here, for a long, we want to know if the oscillator is below 30, like so. All right, so there we go. So we set our first output and now we're getting some results here. So now we know every bar that the oscillator is below 30. And now for the short output, let's put a one in there when the indicator is greater than 70. All right, so there we go. So there's the first part. So we have our detection of right when that oscillator is um, oversold or overbought. <clears throat> All right. Now the next part is we want to make sure that you know that this uh, that this oversold or overbought happens for so many bars, or as the question was written, so many days. Right. So if, if my basically if my chart is a daily chart, then it's going to tell you how many days the oscillator is overbought or oversold. So, but you know as far as technical thinking goes, um, you know, really when you're dealing with charts, you're just counting the number of bars. Um, so if the bar represents a minute, then you're counting the number of minutes. If your chart represents days, then you're counting number of each bar represents a day. So, um, all right. So that, let's see, that's, that's tackle that counting part next here. So we're going to use a function node and we want to count, use the signal counter here. Let's plug that in, plug that in. All right. So, um, so now we just need to determine, you know, like how many, um, how many days um, are we are we looking for so let's say we're looking for I don't know um, at least um, three three days there three days so we want at least three bars you know where the oscillator is either oversold or overbought and then we have the option of a look back period so we could say something like if it's you know if the oscillator is oversold overbought three you know for at least uh, three bars within the last five bars right so the signal counter gives you some flexibility here so you can say if if at least three of the last five bars has an overbought or oversold condition there all right so there you go so we're getting an output here but you can see it's kind of an analog output um, so most people like to use the digital output, like so. There we go. Um, yeah, and so we're basically getting pretty close um, to uh, being done here. All right, so there's kind of some, some results there. Now let's take a look at the original conditions here. Let's kind of mark this up here. There. So we have three bars there. And we have several bars there. 
right? So there we can see that, right, there's a couple of places where we only had two bars where the oscillator was oversold or overbought, and those those will get filtered out like so. Let's see. Now, we're not using any of the resets here, so I'm just going to turn them all off uh, just for good measure. All right. Let's take a look back here a little bit. Oh, yeah. Here's a few more areas here. Let me just get these marked on the chart. There we go. All right. Now, the last step is generating the signal once the oscillator um, moves out, um, you know, either crosses above the level or crosses below the level here. All right, so there we go. We've got our two arrows marking, marking those spots, right? Now, you'll notice that, right, the output that we have extends past the bars, right, where the oscillator is, is oversold here. Uh, right, our, our output over here, um, let's stretch this out a little bit, right, our output over here extends past, right, the, the bars where the oscillator is oversold, right, and that's good. We need that because we need, uh, we need this, you know, this first um, condition, you know, the first condition is detecting uh, the oscillator, right, oversold. And then the last part is detecting when the oscillator uh, is no longer below 30, right? So the oscillator is going to be above 30, but we need that output from when the oscillator is below 30. We need that to be extended forward at least one bar, um, sometimes two bar. It depends on the exact type of, you know, rules that you're looking to build here or conditions that you're looking for, right? So having this output extend past when the oscillator is below 30 is actually a good thing. Well, we actually need that. So, all right. So the last part is um, detecting this crossover here. So we're going to need a couple of crossover solvers to do that. And so let me... Just grab this crossover here, and all right, let's put a name in here. All right, so we're looking for when the ultimate crossover crosses over, um, let's do it this way, it crosses above um, 30, the 30 level. All right, so input A, that's gonna be our indicator. Let's go put the ultimate oscillator in there. All right, there it is. <clears throat> Again, I'm just using the default parameters, so nothing to change. The plot's already selected for us, so we're good to go. Let's click OK. All right. Uh, <clears throat> now, next step um, is input B. That is going to be our 30 level. So that would be a fixed value. So we just type in 30, like so, and there we go, All right? So there's the cross down, a short signal for when the indicator crosses uh, down the 30 and when it crosses above the 30. Uh, but we're only interested in the cross up part. So what we're going to do is ch take the evaluate and we want to see the long only cross ups. So there you go. There's the cross up condition uh, that we're interested in. And yeah, there's a couple more back here. So every time it crosses up, great. Okay. Now we can combine these two together here. All right, so that's just detecting <clears throat> the ultimate oscillator is being oversold for more than three bars. And then if we add our crossover condition in there, plug that in, and there is our signal right there during that cross up. 
All right. So now we need to go back here and work on uh, this situation right here. All right, so we have one of our crossover solvers for the 30 uh, level. So now let's, um, let's see here, let me take a shortcut and I'm gonna go to the solvers tab, All right? So there's our solver for the 30 level. I can make a copy of it and we'll adjust it so that it's looking for the 70 level there. Um, and this time we're not looking for a long output from this salt from that crossover we're looking for the short crossover situation all right so there we go that should do it and switch over to the logic tab so if we go to our solver nodes go to existing nodes and there is that new one I just made for the ultimate oscillator crossing uh, I need to adjust the name there, crossing below 70. So let's adjust that name there. So crossing above, crossing below, XB. All right. <clears throat> now I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug that solver into the result node first and just make sure it's working uh, or set up the way I expect it and yeah so there you go there's the oscillator crossing below 70 yeah cross below 70 so you can see here just the indicator just barely uh, went went above 70 and then it crossed back down so yeah all right so this is working good okay so now we can't just take this and actually plug it into an AND node like that. That doesn't work in this case, right? We actually get nothing now. If we look through the chart, we're getting no results. So what it is is that these two crossover solvers are really kind of one condition. <clears throat> so. So we need to use an OR node, actually, with these two crossovers. So if we take a look at this OR node, right, and take a look at the chart, there we go. So now we can see whenever the oscillator is crossing above 70 or below 70, or I'm sorry, crossing above 30 or below 70. Right, but now we can see all of those kind of crossover situations here. Okay, so, so we want to take this and plug that into the AND node. And let's take a look. All right, and while we were building, we had one more situation like this. The Oscillator was below 70 for more than three bars, and we got our cross up. All right, let's look back here where I marked a couple of others. There we go. So here's the other, the other two uh, situations I had marked up right there. All right, so there we go. Um, let me see if there's any further questions on this. All right, good deal. And so. Um, the key to adjusting all this, um, guys, would be the signal, the signal counter here, where you can determine, you know, what, you know, how many days you're counting for the bar, for the oscillator to be oversold or overbought, right? Counting up to, so that's how many, how many bars we need the oscillator to be oversold or overbought, and then you have a look back period. You can say, okay, the oscillator can be oversold or overbought within you know the last x number of bars so um, you know or you know if if you don't want to have this you know five bar allowance you can just say three and three so that means the oscillator has to be oversold for 
exactly uh, three bars um, within the last three days. But if I do that, you notice all the signals now disappeared. Right? Um, and all the signals disappear because if I take a look at the signal counter, what's happening is, let me grab an arrow, right? So you look, there's no output on that crossover bar anymore, right? There's no output on that crossover bar. So if you don't want to um, so, yeah, so if you don't want to allow for any kind of variance here, um, then what we would need would be a look back node. You have to take a look back node and connect that into the AND node like that. And now things will work. There we go. So what happened is that this look back node has a displacement of one. And right, if we take a look, right, now there's an output on the crossover bar, right? There's an output on that crossover bar there coming from the signal counter, <clears throat> right? So so um, I guess to summarize, right, what we're doing is we're taking we're taking the the bars of which the oscillator is oversold, and we're taking that detection and shifting it forward one extra bar uh, to the crossover bar to the yeah to the bar where the oscillator actually does its crossover right, which is one bar, which is always going to be one bar after. The oversold or over, oversold or overbought period, right? <clears throat> so, all right, but uh, I'll leave that connected there. I'll leave it connected just like that, um, and I'll put this back to three and five. So. All right. So the question was phrased in terms of looking for. Uh, a short signal here. So we're looking for right a red daily bar or a down daily bar, looking for a down range bar, and we're looking for the pro Ranko chart to be down bars. And then we're also looking for the MACDs to all be sloping down. Yeah, so we want to make sure all the MACDs or sloping downward. Yeah, so that, that is the setup for the short. All right, and then, so the short kind of condition ends until two of the MACDs turn up. Yeah, until two of them turn up. So, yeah, so something like, definitely right there, all three MACDs turned up, but we only need two out of the three to turn up, yeah. Let's see if that ever happens here. Looks like it's going to be a rare situation. So it looks like all the MACDs are pretty much turning together. Oh, here we go. Okay, so here's the situation. Yeah. So, uh, let's see this bar. Yeah, so that MACD is still moving upward. But that MACD is obviously moving downward, sloping down, and this other MACD is sloping down. Okay, so there we go. So sometimes, yeah, you will just get two out of the three. All right. Yeah, so that's the question there. All right, let's see. Well, this is a really high time frame system here, so I will probably need to add more days on my Renko chart here. All right, let's add 10 days on there. Um, actually, we're going to need more than that. Um, yeah, so one thing to be aware of with NinjaTrader is um, 
so one of the new things that they implemented with Ninja Trader 7 is you notice how, right, these first 20 bars don't have any indicator calculations, right? So if you're using daily charts, that means you have to have at least 21 days of daily bars before anything is calculated on a daily bar. So um, what that means to us is since, since Bloodhound right, is running on the lower time frame, um, your lowest time frame chart will have to have at least 21 days to, um, to be able to start calculating on the daily charts. So let's put 25 days on there. And so that gives us at least five days in which we can kind of look back and do some testing on. So, and all right, so let's start building here. All right, so with Bloodhound open, let's add the other chart uh, data that we need here. Okay, so we need a, uh, a daily chart and we also need that range chart. There we go, 89 range chart. <clears throat> okay, there's our other time frames. Great, let's switch over to the logic board here. Oh, um, yeah, don't forget, sorry. Um, yeah, remember whenever you add other time frames or charts to your system here, uh, Bloodhound needs to be re, re well, the chart needs to be refreshed so that NinjaTrader can go and fetch that time frame data. So let's re reload the chart. Okay, there we go. And all right, so let's switch over to the logic tab and let's start a new logic template. All right, so let's see here. What should we call this? Uh, three time frame, three ACD signal. All right, so let's, let's we're going to take this one step at a time here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the higher, the highest time frame first. All right, so we'll look at the daily charts first here. So if we go to our solver nodes, or yeah, our solver node pull down menu here, we can see we now have other time frames on here. Right, so we have the default time frame, which is going to be our four pro Ranko chart. Um, then we have the daily and the range. So from the daily, right, I simply just want a bar direction solver. So let's connect that up like so. Look at the bar direction, and let's close Bloodhound and let's take a look back here. Oh yeah, you know another thing you got to keep in mind, guys, is to make sure that the session template all match up. Uh, let's see here. All right, so session template. Uh, let's see. I think the other charts are going to be using the default twenty-four-seven. The range chart. Yeah, it's using default 24-7. And the Pro Ranko chart is using default 24-7. All right, yeah. So make sure your session templates all match up, right? Otherwise, your day will end at different times. Uh, well, yeah, though, if your session templates don't match up, that means the time at which the day ends and the next day begins, they'll all be different, and so you'll you'll see different results, you know, or things won't quite match up because things will be off by uh, several hours. So, um, okay, so now let's scroll back here. Okay, and there. All right, so we can see there, so, uh, where it goes from uh, short output to a long output on the daily bar, right? So we can see, yeah, yesterday was a down day, today's an up day. 
there we go. So, and there's uh, midnight. So that's marking midnight Eastern from uh, Eastern time on the chart there. All right, so we got that confirmed. So now let's look at the range chart. Okay, so I'm gonna, or no, actually I'll do it this way. Let's do it this way. Okay, so from the solver nodes, I can then go down to my range chart and create a bar direction solver from that that time frame. There we go here. All right, let's connect that up. And again, let's see here. Um, Just double check. Yep, range. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. So, what we're looking at is the difference. Oops. Let's see. So, this bar. Let's see what time and oh, I'll have the time. Let's see. So 6 uh, 47 a.m. 6 47 a.m. 9. So this one is 6 47 and this one's 9 a.m. All right. Yep. Yeah. Now, when you're looking at things historically, they're going to be slightly distorted. Right, so things will not match up historically. Um, and so let me ex take a moment to explain. Right, so this range bar, this range bar here, this up range bar, right, you can see it, it closed at 9 um, a.m. Exactly. Wow, that's interesting. So it closed at 9 a.m. exactly. And but if we look at the lower time frame, the way NinjaTrader disseminates data is that on the lower time frame, this range bar is not detected until it closes. Right? So we can see here in the lower time frame. Um, right, so this is 9 a.m. So so once this range bar closes, this up range bar, once it closes up, it's then historically, so this is only happens when you're looking at stuff historically. Historically, it, it, this up range bar is known to the lower time frame chart. And so that's why after 9 a.m. We're, we're seeing green for this range bar being an up range bar. And prior to 9 a.m., right, so even though this range bar here was up, you know, prior to it closing, right, so while this range bar is building, it was a range bar, but when you look at things historically, this is, this is the information that NinjaTrader gives you to your system here. Um, so it looks like it was a down bar. But if we were looking at this in real time, this would all be identified as an up range bar in real time. Right, but historically things get, um, uh, how do we say, historically data gets shifted a little bit because historically Ninja Trader always has to wait for the bar to close. So you have to wait until after the closing time to know whether that was an up or down bar. Right. So basically when you're kind of mixing and matching time frames like this, especially if you're trying to do it for a real time system, 
you'll never see historical results exactly the way they would play out in real time. All right, so you would have to use um, you would have to use your market replay connection to really be able to look at stuff historically when it when your system needs to operate in real time. All right, so keep that in mind. Um, but in any case, um, moving on with the testing here. So, you know, I know that, um, that, uh, yeah, this is working here. So once this range bar closes up at nine, nine AM, we're getting this long output and let's see this, this next bar range bar is a down bar. 931. So let's move forward to 931. There we go. All right, so 931. And let's see what's the seconds here. Yeah, 931 and 48 seconds. And there we go. There's 931 and 48 seconds, and now it's marked as, as a down bar. All right, so that's working. So let's work on the next pieces here. All right, now simply put, we need the bar directions to all be in agreement. So that would be an AND node right there. Um, and next, uh, next, let's take a look at the three MACDs. Um, all right, so the, the, those solvers are going to be on the default time frame, right? So the MACD is running on the four Pro Renko charts. So that's the default time frame. So we're going to use the slope solver here. Let's plug that in. And MACD, all right, 24, 42, and 12. Okay, let's get this open a little bit. There we go. All right, so let's go set up the MACD here. And let's plug those settings in. So 24, 42, and 12. All right, and we're looking at the MACD plot. So that's already selected for us. We're done. And uh, there we go. So it's going to be the thicker MACD line here. All right, so there we go. Slope is marked, easy enough. And let's see here. So I'm going to switch over to the solver tab and I can take that MACD um, Solver, make a copy of it, and adjust the periods here. Change the name, and then go in and change the indicator settings. All right, just double checking my work here. All right, there's the second one, and now to make the last one here. Eight, six. 13 and 11. All right, so now we have all three MACDs. Uh, those solvers are built, so now let's put them on the logic board here. So we go to the solver nodes, existing nodes, and you notice there's the three time frames for existing nodes, but we're on the default time frame. So let's put that one on there and put this last MACD solver on there. All right. Um, and let's grab another AND node. All right, so now what we're looking at with this AND node is, is looking at is, let's see, so all three MACDs, basically they're in, um, 
in alignment. And let's see if we ever find a situation here where they're not. Oh yeah, there we go. So that, that was that area I found earlier. So, all right, another one. And a couple more areas there, so there we go. All right, um, let's see here. Let's also, while we're at it, um, yeah, let's build a logic that looks for two out of three, two out of the three MACDs. Um, so let's do that, let's see here. Um, so normally we'd use an additive node to do this. All right. But since we need to use an AND node and this additive node, well, yeah. Let me just build it and I'll explain it later. So, um, so we're going to have to take the MACD and plug it into an OR node. So these OR nodes are kind of providing uh, a workaround for what's needed for the additive node here. All right, and I'm going to, I'm gonna name these OR nodes here so we know which MACD the OR nodes are connected to. All right, so the way the additive node can check for Something like two out of three, three out of four, three out of five, um, is by using the sliders here. All right, so you have to do a little bit of math here to figure this out. So if, um, remember, so the additive node is, is taking the outputs and it's adding them together, All right? So originally, the additive node was used if you're building a fuzzy logic system. And, and right, and so, you know, let's say you had some fuzzy logic coming out of these slope solvers, right? You could use the additive node to add those outputs together. But in this case, what we're going to be using the additive node is just basically counting two out of three um, in a way. So, um, so what you do is you take the, the number of, the number of connections to the additive node. So we have three connections, but if we only need two out of three, so we have three connections. So you take one divided by three. So each connection is worth, um, a third, uh, actually, no, we only need two out of three. So sorry, the math there was a little wrong. So each connection um, would be a half. So since I'm trying to detect two out of the three, so I take one divided by two, and that's a half. So with the additive node, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the slider here and adjust them all down to 0.5. Sometimes it's actually easier just to type in the box. So there you go, 0 0.5 and 0.5. All right, so you can see, so the attitude node will take, you know, 0 0.5 and add it to 0 0.5 and add it to 0 0.5. So if only two of these connections um, are in agreement, right, then that equals one. And let's take a look here. Yeah, and if we take a look at the Bloodhound output down here, you'll see sometimes, um, right? Sometimes we get, uh, we'll get a long output and a short output. So the, what this is telling you here is that one of the MACDs is still sloping up and the other two are sloping down. And here it happens here again. So yeah, so I can see that the the slower MACD is still sloping up, but the faster MACDs are sloping down. So I get so I get right half of a long output and um, 
a short output here. So let's see, just to kind of play around with the logic here, right? So here, yeah, so here we're looking for all the Mac, MACD slopes to be in agreement. All right, uh, I'm sorry. I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a moment here. So basically this additive node is going to be used like a switch. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at this, right? So, so let's just say, you know, hypothetically, when these rank bars started going up, you know, the other time frames were in alignment. Um, you know, the other higher time frames had up bars, right? So this would begin like a long, uh, a long condition, right? A long situation. And then we'd want that long condition to, to continue until we had two out of the three MACDs um, disagreeing. And so, Basically, so we'd need to take this long output and continue to extend it forward, right? Because it could possibly be that only one MACD um, turns down, right? And the other two MACD still could be sloping up. Um, let's see. Hmm. Actually, kind of got me thinking. Maybe... Well, actually, no, I guess we need to leave it this way because I'm, I'm guessing that for, for the long signal to start, you need all three MACDs sloping up. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the way I read the question is that all three MACDs have to be sloping together in agreement for a long signal or a short signal to begin, but... For that signal to turn off, we're just looking for two MACDs to disagree. Yeah. So, let's see here. So, I'm going to grab a toggle node. Right. Now, you notice how that toggle node... Um, Filled in these couple of bars here where the MACD, uh, where two of the MACDs had sloped down. All right. Here, let's stretch this out and make it obvious. There we go. All right, so it, the, the toggle node had basically filled in that area there. All right. So if I, if I go back here. To my logic board, if I take a look at the original AND node, right, we had this area here where there was no long output. Then I use that toggle node to kind of fill in that. But then I can take this, the signals from this additive node, right, so we can see that we have short short signals coming from the additive node here. And I can use these short signals because what, what's happening is these short signals are telling me that two, two of the MACDs, two out of three of the MACDs are sloping down, which is cause to, to stop or turn off that long signal. So I can take this additive node, connect it into the reset, like so. And then for the toggle node, I need to go to my reset section here. Right, go to my reset section. And so I am using an opposite signal. So in other words, I'm using what's coming out of the what's coming out of the additive node is I'm using short signals, which are opposite of the long entry signals, right? So on the toggle node, I'm using an opposite signal and I wanna force the toggle node off like so. Yeah, all right, so there's that. 
And so now we just need to connect all the pieces together. So let's zoom in here. All right, so let's see, let's name this here. So this is the higher time frame, um, higher time frame bars, basically. And, oh, you know what? I'm missing one piece here. Let me, let me just take a look. Um, oh yeah, I'm missing the um, lower time frame. I'm missing the pro ranko bars here. So let's adjust this here. So I need to go to, let's see, default time frame, and I need to add a bar direction for the pro ranko bar. There we go. There. Okay. So instead of this being the higher time frame bars, this is all right. All um, all bar uh, directions. There we go. Okay. All right. So this toggle node here <clears throat> basically is kind of like looking at our our MACD logic there. So we've got our MACD logic. Um, so we need to take the uh, the bar direction from all the time frames. So actually, I guess let's call it this: uh, all time frame bar directions. There we go. Plug that in there. Plug in our MACD uh, logic, and there we go. And that should do it. Oh, and let me take a step back here. Um, I didn't explain why I was using these OR nodes. Um, so, yeah, looking back on the additive node. So what I did is, um, remember I had to use the sliders for the additive node and I set the sliders to 0.5. Well, what that did is, if you look at the color of this, right? So what I actually adjusted the slider on was the slider on the OR node, right? I didn't want to adjust the actual solvers themselves. So if I connected the solver directly to the additive node, then when I change this, the sliders, it would actually change the output of the actual slope solvers here, which I don't want to do because I don't want that to affect this AND node. All right, I need this AND node to be uh, looking at the um, unaltered values of the solvers here. All right. So let me let me kind of show you an example. If I so if I select this AND node, and if well actually hold on, let's take a look at let's take a look at one of these slope solvers here. So if you take a look at the the uh, slider value up here, it's set to one, right? It's it's set to one. So that's this slope solver, uh, right? Its output is. Uh, set to one and one, so it's 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 un, unaltered. It's on its default. Um, if I take a look the, at this OR node, right, I can see this OR node is set to 0.5. So you take a look at where it says the selected node, right? So the select this is the the node that's selected. This OR node selected, and it is adjusted to 0.5, right? And I did that. From the from the additive node, right? So the connected nodes. So if you notice these three down here, it's inside the connected nodes. The additive node, which is the one that's selected, is the slider up on top. Right. So going back to this AND node, if I take one of the connected nodes, you know, one of the input nodes, right, and I adjust it to 0.5. Uh, right, like just like what I did with the with the additive node, right? I had to adjust all the inputs to 
for the additive node, right? Well, if I do that on the AND node, because remember the AND node is connected directly to this uh, slope solver. Uh, so if I look at the slope solver, right, this slope solver, the solver itself has been adjusted down to 0.5. And, um, right, so I, I don't want the additive node to be affecting the solvers directly because now this solver's output is only going to 0.5. So if I connect that in, right, if we look at the output here, from Bloodhound, right, that solver never has a full output. It never goes to 100%. So therefore, this, this AND node would not work correctly. Basically, the logic would not work correctly uh, for the AND node and the toggle node. So I had to use these OR nodes to take that adjustment. So these OR nodes were adjusted down to the 0.5, which is what the additive node needed. And that left the actual solver nodes themselves to stay at their default value of one. Right. So there we go. Now that node right has the normal output that we're norm that we're normal normally used to seeing, right, uh, with an output of, of 1 or 100%. So, all right, anyways, that was the long way around to explaining why the OR nodes were needed here. But, bottom line, so there is our system. All right, so let's take a look um, and see what we have here. <clears throat> and oh I need to yeah remember so I needed to adjust my the bloodhound calculate on bar close to false there we go and let's see I don't think we're going to get any signals because the daily bar is up the range bar is down and yeah, so those two time frames are out of sync here. Let's see if we can find an instrument where things are in sync here. So yeah, let's synchronize these charts like so. All right, let's take a look at uh, what probably the NQ? Oh, and let me connect back to my data feed here. There we go. Oh, let's see where are we at. Oh shoot! Look at that. The daily bar just went negative. Interesting. Take a look at my other charts. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but our range bar is up. Ah shoot. All right. <clears throat> Oh, there we go. Awesome. Daily bar went positive. Range bar is positive. Ranko bars um, are up. And our MACD are sloping. They're all sloping up. Yep, so it took a couple of bars for the slower MACD. And bingo. All the MACDs turned down and the long signal turned off. There we go. Okay, long again. Let's see if we can get just one of these MACDs to turn down. Oh, yeah, that's another thing is this is all running in real time here. Our MACDs, oops, should have calculum bar close set to false as well. All right, yeah, so you noticed how those signals that we had once are gone now. Right, and that's because those bars are now historical. So remember, we're dealing with this historical mismatch of bar data, right? So that's why real-time systems sometimes can't be uh, tested historically. So, so we just have to wait for some real-time bars here. Uh, hopefully the market will move up again and start generating some long signals. 
All right, this, oh, looks like the market's trying to. There we go. All right, and let's see what happens when we get a pullback bar. Okay, yeah, I can see the MACDs. The two faster ones are, they're gonna slope down, whereas the slower one, yeah, even the slower one's sloping down. All right. In any case, you know, this, I think this, this is a good test here, kind of proved, uh, you yeah, know, the, the logic is working. Yeah, let's take a look at the YM just as one other, one last kind of double check. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> so on the YM, uh, it's a big down day on the YM. And our range chart, yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to go down anytime soon. All right, so the YM's yeah, not a good time. So I'll just put it back on the... Put it back on the NQ. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll test. We'll test the ES here. Oh no, these were historical results. Which, again, clearly the historical results are wrong because today's daily bar is a down bar. All right, but remember the way Ninja Trader disseminates data historically it's actually looking at the yesterday's up bar so yes yeah, so we kind of had to ignore all this historical data here and just look at what what was happening in real time um and let's see here actually we do have some long signals here happening in real time um Hmm, but yeah, today's daily bar is a down bar. What's, all right, let me just double check blood down. Yeah, it is set to false. Okay, um, let's take a look at the logic here and see what's going on here. All right, so I know the daily bar is a down bar. So if I do this, yeah, that's weird. All right, so for some reason, um, Ninja Trader is telling Bloodhound that today's uh, bar direction is up. That's kind of weird. Um, things are looking correct on the range bar. Yeah, but yeah, that daily bar is not correct. Um, oh, let's try this trick. Yeah, okay, let's try this. So here's a, a little trick that Ninja Trader uh, will suggest if you're not getting the correct data from a daily chart. Um, yeah, so their solution is instead of using a daily chart to switch over to a minute chart. And we want to use a 1440, a 1440 minute chart. So that there's 1440 minutes in one day. Right? So that's kind of a a a workaround to generating a daily bar uh, for intraday use. Um, uh, all right, yes, yeah, so let's take a look at that. And since I changed the chart time frame, I need to refresh the chart. And let's see, what did I have connected up? Yeah, there we go. Oh, look at that. All right. So now we're getting the correct output. Okay. So it's a good thing we tested that. Good thing we checked that out. Um, and then we should probably also change this from a daily chart to a minute, right? Just so everything is exactly the same. 
there. Oh, um. All right, let me connect this all together. Let's see what we get. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, so we can see here um, that this range bar was probably a down bar um, at one point, and so we were getting some short signals here. Let's see. Yeah, if the market moves down again, we should start generating some short signals. Yep, there we go. Almost did. This closes down one more bar. Yeah, so our slower MACD needs to start sloping down and these will all start producing some short signals here. Almost, come on. <laughs> Waiting on the market to do what you want it to do is, yeah, it's a losing battle. All right, but there we go. Cool. Our MACDs are down. Yep, our range bar is down. The daily bar is obviously down. And there is our signals. All right, cool. So I think we got this one uh, tackled here. So let me just um, open up Bloodhound here and leave it on the logic board. All right, guys, then uh, I look forward to your guys' questions in tomorrow's uh, Blackbird workshop. All right, if I don't see you tomorrow, then have a good weekend. All right, guys, okay, bye-bye.